Today I'm in my new sound studio and I am like so excited because I was looking at the interview I did on video with David Arnold and was thinking, oh my goodness, <laughs> I looked terrible. So I'm, I'm in a new space. I'm very excited about it. Hopefully the sound is uh, really good because I've got a great guest today. Uh, but I want to start off and just say, you know, every six months or so, I like to um, go through my closet and get rid of stuff, get rid of shoes and purses and, you know, all my cl clothes I haven't worn in the last year. And I find that like super satisfying, very freeing. And my guest today is a downsizing expert. She's somebody who deals with this topic every day with people on how to get rid of stuff and why less is more. She's ironically an interior designer, which I kind of think is an interesting twist on, <laughs> on that since you kind of are somebody who buys stuff to design uh, and helps people with that. But um, she has done a TEDx uh, talk on downsizing and why less is more. So we're going to talk about this, this today. She's an author and a blogger as well. Welcome, Rita Wilkins. Thank you. I'm so <laughs> glad to be here with you, Patty. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And I love talking about downsizing. Well, it, I think I'm so excited about this topic today because I, I feel like it's a, uh, let me move my camera up here. I, I feel like it's a um, topic that um, people are more into these days than probably ever before. They're really into um, having less stuff to pay for, less stuff to maintain, uh -huh. and, uh -huh. and realizing the freedom of it. But I was wondering, you know, kind of yourself, your own story, were you always a minimalist? Like somebody who didn't have a lot of stuff? <laughs> no, actually, I was exactly the opposite. Now, remember, I'm a baby boomer, and we baby boomers created the consumerist society. So I was one of those, and I was in that, um, in that realm of I had to have a bigger house, bigger car, nicer this, nicer that. That went on for many, many years. And then... I um, and I've had an interior design firm for 35 years. We've dealt with, we've had beautiful projects all over the country. So it's not like I don't know what beautiful stuff is and I have a, a, an appreciation for it. But it was a trip to a third world country where I visited my son who was in Senegal at the time in the Peace Corps, and I stayed with him for a month in his hut. And the very first few minutes of my arrival the village elder picked up a live scrawny chicken and handed it to me as my gift. And I knew how valuable that one little chicken was to that village. And then that evening, my son's African mother prepared a beautiful dinner for 15 people that included that little chicken. And she also <clears throat> pushed the better part of the chicken towards my son and myself. So it was in that moment that I really did change. I said, you know, my goodness, these people have nothing, but they're so generous and they're happy. And that was my entire experience for the entire month that I stayed there in his tiny little hut. Um, so I came home, and this is part of my book. I came home and nothing looked the same to me. I had a beautiful 5,000 square foot home in the country in Chester County, beautiful area near Longwood Gardens and Winter Tour. And when I walked in, Nothing looked the same. And it was really then my journey began, but it didn't happen overnight. I just couldn't figure out what, what's going on here. So for a, another couple of years, I just stayed with my stuff. And finally, one day I said, what am I doing? I have this big house, the big yard, having to work harder just to pay for people to help me with the property and so forth. And then I, I downsized to my tiny little apartment in Philadelphia. I gave away 95% of what I once owned to people who wanted it or needed it. Wow, 95%. You gave away 95% of all your stuff. You only kept a yeah. very, uh, what did, what did you yeah. just like keep shoes? <laughs> That's probably what I would keep. <laughs> That's funny. Actually, I, that was a hard part, giving away shoes. But I honestly, I've never been happier. I'm living on 5%. I have a beautiful little jewel box apartment in Center City, Philadelphia, in this beautiful historic area. And I've never been happier. So that was the, really the inspiration for then the TEDx talk, which occurred last November, Downsize Your Life, Why Less is More. And what I really got from my downsizing journey was the impact of living with less. 
So remember where I started. It wasn't with, um, I had 5,000 square feet full of stuff and then some. But now I'm living on 5%. And what happens is I have more time, money, and freedom. And who wouldn't want that? Well, absolutely. That does mm-hmm. make a lot of sense. I, I know um, myself, I still have a lot of stuff. But uh, my husband and I used to have a house on the water. And uh-huh. at that time, this was when the kids were growing up. And we had a boat. We had a, like, I don't know, like a, I guess it was maybe a 27 or 28 foot you know, crown line boat with a cabin. We uh-huh. had a boathouse. We had a pier, a bulkhead with all that that you got to maintain, of course, yeah. <laughs> and pay for. Yeah. We had a jet yeah. ski. You know, we had a lot of stuff. We had a camper, and those were all great toys. And the kids, you know, loved it. But to be honest with you, the the John boat that we had, the little John boat, you know, that you just has okay. a little motor, you know, and you yeah. you right. Yeah. We used to crab, you know, out on the on the water there and that that was probably the, the most fun was actually not the bigger boat but just a simple little john mm-hmm. boat that you're out there crabbing with your son or your you know yeah. your daughter but um when i i was thinking about this when i was you know preparing to talk to you today and i was thinking back when we moved i you know was thinking wow people thought we were nuts to move off the water we don't live on the water anymore we moved specifically for a school system mm-hmm. uh, about 14 15 years ago and I was thinking, wow, I'm going to really miss it. All that. But to be honest with you, I never looked back. I mean, it was like, That's awesome. and, and we actually, that yeah. particular house on the water, we took a rambler and made, we went up uh, a second level on it. We went up and out and did all this, uh, put a seven by 40 porch on the front with the footers and all that cantilever. And I pulled every permit myself with the county. It was a lot of work. It was a labor yeah. of love for many years, but it was like, wow, once we were gone, it was like, I just never, I never looked back. It was four walls to me at that Isn't that interesting? Yeah. yeah. So of all the things that I gave away, the one thing I miss is a yellow linen suit that didn't fit me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> what did that so, little, what did that linen, yellow linen suit represent to you? It represented just a really good time of my life. Um, I remember wearing it to a very special occasion. I was with people that I loved and they loved me. And so the yellow linen suit was just a yellow linen suit. I can always buy another one. But it did represent those memories, Mm -hmm. which is true of most of the things that we do when we give away. Another um, time when I was, (coughs) excuse me, when I was um, downsizing, I found my father's alarm clock. And that alarm clock, I could hear him winding it to get up and to provide for our family. So that alone was, <coughs> I'm so sorry, that that alarm clock meant so much to me because I remember our father providing for us as we were, you know, as we were growing up, he would get up in the morning and, and provide a, you know, wonderful lifestyle for our family. That's all the clock meant. So when we discovered it, and my sister was helping me that particular weekend, and when she saw it too, she cried. But then she said, Rita, you know, dad wouldn't want us to to cry over an alarm clock. So we took a picture of it and we created a Shutterfly book around several of pieces like that. And we have the story in Shutterfly so that someday when my sons and my grandchildren to be um, see this um, alarm clock and, and several other pieces, they'll understand the story behind what what would have made me cry over an alarm clock. Yeah, mm. and well, and that's what's always so interesting. right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. That is so true, though. You look at something and you hold it in your hand and it, and it, and it brings back so many memories. I have a brownie camera that was my father's. Oh, that, my goodness. Yeah, yeah. I know. You yeah. know what a brownie camera is for those who sure. don't. It's a little brown <laughs> kind of cube-like uh, camera. It's kind of very square-looking and my father, when he was about, I don't know, he was young. He was about 14 years old in Nebraska. He would he hopped on the train, and he would go, and sometimes by himself, sometimes with a friend, and he would take photos. He would go along to all the different stations, and he would take photos along his journey. And, I mean, why his parents, uh, you know, let him do that? I don't know. <laughs> I go <laughs> hop on the train. He loved trains, yeah. and, you know, yeah. um, but that camera... I do have that camera today, and it's, you know, sitting on a storage shelf in my basement, 
But sure. but I, sure. I see what you mean that it's, you know, some of those things you could simply take a photo of and yeah. and make a book and really serve well, the same purpose. And that really does provide an outlet for people to hold on in some way to the things that matter to them. And certainly um, the Brownie camera meant a lot to you. And, and it was the, the clock and several other pieces that I kept. But the reality is that it's really just the memories and the memories do not go away. The piece can go away. So uh, one of the issues that we have when we're helping people with their downsizing journey is how do I let go of my stuff? So we've created many funny things around it. And one of them is it's not a mortal sin to give away gra granny's um, heirlooms. <laughs> and of course, you know, when you, when you can kind of look at it with memories, tell the story about it, listen to the story, have people there in your life that your children or your grandchildren or your, you know, other people hear the stories about, you know, your, the, about the brownie camera or about the alarm clock or whatever it is that matters to you, have them hear the story, write it down, and then you can let it go. It's far easier. Yeah. Now, do you find that uh, in your line of work, when you're when you're talking somebody through how to downsize, what to how to evaluate things and review things, are do you find you're almost playing therapist because people <laughs> go down that <laughs> down that rabbit hole of all those memories of you know the things you do you do, you do. and and they just have to get that what what's more important to them staying with all of this stuff staying in the big house. Staying with a basement full of stuff you haven't seen in 10 years or in your attic. Having your garage filled with so much stuff that on a Saturday, rather than going out with your family or doing something fun like going to the beach, you're having to clean out the garage. And when you start to say, what kind of lifestyle do you really want? That's when they start to get a little bit more real about the importance of, of getting rid of a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and once they get that, no, I'd really rather, you know, in my case, I live in a tiny little apartment. I live right in the heart of the city. And every minute this weekend is probably going to just be fun. So I have more time, money and resources for things that really matter to me. So that's the conversation that we have, having them visualize what life could be like if they didn't have the big house, the big yard, all of the stuff to take care of. So they can go out and buy more stuff and organize it again and throw it away. <laughs> so well, it's a crazy cycle. And isn't that the weird th – that's the weird thing. It's like people, uh, they spend their whole lives trying to accumulate things, the big mm -hmm. house, the cars, the boats, the campers, whatever it may be, their collections, mm -hmm. uh, gun collections or their car collections or whatever it is they're into. And then they spend the, the golden years at some point trying to get rid of it all. Right. Well, yeah. And what's interesting to me, and, and we also study demographics. So a demographic shift that's occurring right now is that baby boomers like me are, for the most part, choosing to start getting rid of their stuff. Many of them are either downsizing, right sizing. Um, a few of them, like my sister, actually upsize. <laughs> but um, that's a little bit more the rare occasion. We're actually looking for a, clear, a, a simpler, more meaningful life. So in our third act, we're actually looking for what could I do to make a difference for the, for the number of years that I have left on this earth? So many baby boomers are creating new businesses. They're traveling a lot more. They're spending more time with their children. So the, the reality is it's about experiences, not stuff. And, and so finally, we've caught on to that as baby boomers. And, and so many of us are downsizing. Now, ironically, the millennial... And I, I have two sons that fall into, into that category, just a little bit older than millennial. But they, they will never accumulate the stuff. When I started downsizing, they clearly said, Mom, we do not want your stuff. And mm -hmm. while that hurt for the minute, <laughs> I totally got it because I lived in tiny apartments in Washington and Manhattan. So number one, they didn't have the space. Number two, it really didn't matter to them. They took a few things that mattered to them. And so we really have to just get real. Why did we buy it in the first place? And typically, we buy things because it made us feel good or it was filling a gap. You know, so for me, I was, I was newly single and, you know, filling a gap, I would shop. And I mean, I totally get that now. I didn't understand it then. But how many more pairs of shoes does one really need? 
Well, this is true. <laughs> My, what, who was that uh, politician's wife? Uh, 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 Amilda Marco. Remember okay. Milda Marco, the yeah. famous story yeah. that was from a million years ago, but yeah. she had yeah. some, you know, unbelievable number of she shoes. Shoe rooms. Yeah, she yeah. had rooms yeah. full of shoes, yeah. a house yeah. full of yeah. shoes. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. so crazy that people, do you, do you find that um, in, in your work, are you mostly working with baby boomers that are downsizing, that are trying to free themselves of all their, of a lot of stuff? Or do you work with people that are Gen Xers and millennials that Mm -hmm. want to, that have a lot of stuff and that you're Mm -hmm. helping them with get rid of stuff? So we come from wherever they are at that moment. And primarily it's my demographic, the baby boomer, you know, whether it be a a leading edge or trailing edge baby boomer. So that spans about 22 to 24 years. Um, We were the ones most guilty of buying all that stuff because we could, because we wanted to, and because we were influenced by so many of the ads. What's interesting to me, and I, I think that this pretty much holds true, many, not all, of the Gen Xers and of the millennials are just not accumulating. When you think about it, if they want if they want a really fancy car, they can go rent one for the weekend. If they want to stay in a really fancy um, condo or something um, for, for the weekend or for the week, they can go rent that. So our our whole society is shifting in terms of not having to buy all of these things. We can actually, we can actually rent them. Um, So many of the younger people are teaching us that and we're catching on very, very quickly. So as an example, many of our very, very wealthy clients, they could well afford to have their three, four or five homes all over the country. But many of them, and not all, are choosing to rent And the reason they're renting is they have a lot more flexibility, mobility, and not a lot of responsibility. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) Yeah, I know. And when you think about it, you know, at this stage of the game, wouldn't it be nice not to have to have all that responsibility? So, yeah, um, Yeah, absolutely. I've, (laughs) I've had so many people complain, oh, my God, there's so much work to do when you have three, four or five homes. Now, you know, listening to that as a designer... And as a single mother who was struggling, that was not an easy conversation to listen to. But on the other hand, I totally got it. They just had a lot of money. They bought their big, beautiful homes. We actually helped them design many of their big, beautiful homes. But what they really discovered was that this takes time away from things that really matter to them. How do you, well, how do you, if you're you're first talking to somebody and and they have a... Mm -hmm crap a ton of stuff uh-huh. what would you how do you walk them through like what's the process look like when you first say okay these are the first things you need to, to the steps you need to go through in the beginning middle kind of end thing okay so we have a little conversation about where would they want to live and so let's just take me i i wanted to live in a city i've never lived in a city before so that's that was how i began my journey and then once i understand okay well that's probably approximately a thousand or twelve hundred square feet what would that provide? And so depending on what their specific needs are, um, we we would begin there. Then we created what we called the ABCs of downsizing. It's actually on YouTube. It's called the ABCs of downsizing with my name, Rita Wilkins. And you can go there and you can use that. It's, um, it was a methodology as designers, we take a big building and of course it could be overwhelming, but rather than being overwhelmed by it, you just chunk it down into smaller bits. So when I was downsizing from my 5,000 square foot home, I said, oh, well, I'll just do what I do as a designer. And that's create a process that is very easy to follow. So we created ABCs. So an A item would be those things that no matter what, they're coming with me. The B items are the ones that if they fit, if they look good, and if they work for you, they can come. And the C items are those items that you would just automatically get rid of. And it's, it's really easy to look at the A, <clears throat> you know, there was a, a, a chest that it was my mother's and it really meant a lot to me. And did I really have space for it? Not really, but it looks so great in my apartment. Um, and then the C items are usually very easy to get rid of because that's the stuff that's been hanging around for years anyway. So once you get rid of the C items and actually get them out of the house, So donate, sell them, get rid of them. You could already start to see progress. The A items per room, I like to put them in one corner of the room. 
And then what's left are the B items. Now, for me, the B items that were hardest for me were clothing. I had 11 closets and nine rolling racks filled with clothes. And the yellow linen suit. <laughs> and the li- <laughs> I'm remembering that. <laughs> when, one day I'm going to see somebody walking around with my yellow linen suit. It's just going to make me smile. <laughs> yeah, so, um, but, but once, you, once you look at the A and the C and then, then what's left is the B, the B takes a little bit more time. And so if it's clothing, so then work on something else that's a little bit easier. Maybe linens or, you know, certain closet areas. Work on the areas that you can make progress and my, job, my downsizing journey took me a year, but rather than making it a job, I had so much fun. I have wonderful memories of downsizing, and that really sounds crazy. Yeah, that sounds really crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I got to say. I'm all about having fun. And so <laughs> I created what, what I called was a game. And so I called everybody on my list, family, friends, um, really good clients, and I said, look, I'm downsizing. Would you come and help me for just four hours on a Saturday or Sunday? And, and we'll attack just one small area of my home at a time. And, and during that hour, those times, we would get rid of stuff. It would actually go to Goodwill or go wherever. So it was gone. And then we would drink wine. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, <laughs> so, that, <laughs> now I know why it was fun. <laughs> yeah, that was the fun part. And so I have wonderful memories of family and friends who love me coming to help me. Now, mind you, I'm the first one on their list, too, because it does go both ways. So um, we were dirty, sweaty, but we had had fun. We laughed. We took crazy photos of us looking crazy and mess. silly and all that. <laughs> but, but it was wonderful. And so I have great memories. And so why not make a game of it? Yeah. You know, it is overwhelming. And I have to admit, I cried a number of times. You know, it's not Aww. easy. But... Um, you know, you just, you go through that part and then you remember, wow, these people love me and they're here this weekend. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Do you uh, recommend, like, if you go in a house and uh, you're working with somebody, do you recommend that you take everything out of a room and then <laughs> sort through it or sort through it while it's all still in the room? Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. It kind of depends on their circumstances. If they're already in another house, Again, that's an ideal situation. So they, they already have another house. So then what we can do is space planning according to what, what what's on their A-list. And so we get that stuff and we put it into the new house. Now, that's not always the case. Mm-hmm. Um, but if it is, that's ideal. And, and then the C things are gone. And then all that's left in that old house are the B things. Um, so it, it really just depends. We attack it from what, wherever the people are at that time. I choose to probably leave it in the room so that they can actually live there and function there. And all you do is you start to see it all edited. So it starts to look pretty pristine. And, and they'll say, well, why didn't I live this way before? You know, it looks so uncluttered. It looks, I've, it's so much more peaceful. Mm-hmm. And of course that helps resale is to not have all that stuff in the way anyway. So if we come in early enough before they actually list the house, we can help them actually stage it and get it ready and get rid of some of their stuff that they were going to get rid of anyway. Mm -hmm. Well, I think for me, my husband loves to collect stuff. I would say junk, really. He likes to, I can't tell you how many houses he's gone in where somebody died and then the people were like, oh, take whatever you want. Of the, you know, it's it's just the, the leftover stuff. And mm-hmm. he'll drag home some dead person's this or that. And it's like, oh my God, please stop. Like, <laughs> stop bringing it. He'll bring in, yeah. you know, those things you chop meat or you, like they used to use them in butcher shops, I guess. Real old fashioned, really heavy, in mm-hmm. fact. They're made out of probably... Mm-hmm some kind of steel that they would like a meat slicer mm-hmm. i mean it mm-hmm. weighs you know 250 right. pounds i mean it's like ridiculous stuff like we'll never use it and then his argument is always oh it's worth millions yeah <laughs> he always yeah. says that it's like no it's not it's not worth millions and i don't want it and i don't care if it was worth millions i don't want it <laughs> you know <it's> like, <laughs> <laughs> but it's very hard to deal with i don't know if you come across that very often but very, when you're dealing with a couple where you have one that is totally cool with like, yeah, let's get rid of crap. I don't, I don't need it. I don't, I want to free myself of it, you know, but then you have the other spouse or the other person that's mm-hmm. just like holding on to everything, making it yep. difficult to get rid of stuff. 
That's my everyday life. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. Well, I feel much better. <laughs> That's then. where marriage counseling comes in really handy yeah. sometimes. <laughs> yeah. So um, actually what helps is being the third party because I can say things maybe to your husband that you couldn't say, or if you did, it would stir up a battle and he could say things to me. And so I'm the conduit and all of that's okay because I'm simply there to help both of you, not just one or the other. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, having a third party does kind of help. So, you know, whether you hire a designer or, or just have a friend there that can shoot straight to say, you know, Charlie, what are you thinking? Yeah, <laughs> um, <get> or, <laughs> right. you know, again, get them into the idea of, you know, when we move to that smaller space, um, you know, how important is this to you? Really, and have him start to think about it. It's better that it comes from him that he said, oh, that was the most ridiculous thing I've ever bought. Um, and that would be ideal. It doesn't always happen that way. And it doesn't happen overnight. But sometimes if you plant that seed and then he might look at it a little differently, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. But our goal is to kind of help people through all of that because it is emotional no matter what. And, and people get attached to their things. And, and if you can look at why am I attached to this? That's really the question you have to start asking yourself. So for me, the, my dad's alarm clock, that was really important to me. I wasn't attached after we talked about it because we realized it wasn't the clock at all. It was the memories of him winding that clock every morning. That's what mattered to us. Mm -hmm. So get at the root of why does that matter to you? Sometimes people are just guilty over giving away some of this stuff because, you know, we were told that that silver is so valuable, that crystal is so valuable. All right, so then use it mm -hmm. <laughs> every day rather than having it be stored. You know, we've been told a lot of stories over the years. And then, of course, there's that favorite aunt, and she gave you this, and she would just die. She's already dead, but she would just die if you gave that away. Um, so really look at that and say, you know, but I have my memories of her and that's what matters. And, and certainly there'll be a few pieces that you'll choose to take. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, when I have clients that uh, they need to move, the, a spouse died and they have a house full of stuff and now yep. they're single and they're, or whatever, or divorcing or whatever it may be, or they're just downsizing. So they're going to a smaller space. Um, my assistant, her husband has a company, an auction house called Alexandria Auctions. Give them a nice plug. They do a fantastic job where they will, you can, you can put things in that auction. He does an auction online every week and mm -hmm. it's based out of, out of Alexandria, Virginia, but it's, you sell your stuff. You know, he gets a percentage just like any auction house does. Yep. You sell your stuff, but you don't, you know, and then people come there, there to that location, that warehouse, and they pick up, it's like pick up Saturdays or whatever. And it's an easy way for people to get rid of stuff in bulk. They don't mm -hmm. have to put it on eBay. They don't have to put it in a yard sale in their front yard. They don't have to do any of that stuff. It makes it really easy, you know, that they handle it. And I, it seems like that, and yet, you know, it's being repurposed. It's not being thrown in a dumpster. And filling up mine, you know, filling up um, those, um, what do you call the it? The landfills. The yeah. landfills, thank you. The right. landfills. <laughs> mm -hmm. That it's like all this trash, and, and mm -hmm. a lot of it isn't trash to somebody else. You right. know, somebody right. wants that, you know, china or that, you know, silver or whatever it is that, you know, you want to get rid of. So I don't know if yeah. you use those. Do you <laughs> use like an auction house also, something like that? Yes. Um, another thing to think about, and this is this was my methodology. I called my nieces, my nephews, um, anyone that might have just, you know, built, had their first home and asked them if they wanted anything. And of course, they said, oh, I'd love that sofa. I'd love that. Or I'd love. Good. Then bring a truck and come and pick it up. And if you don't pick it up, it's going to go to somebody else. Anyway, they got a kick out of that. But there were many weekends. They came early with their their U-Haul truck and they hauled it away. And, and it felt so good to have that, you know, belong to them. Mm -hmm. I mean, the worst case scenario is you're going to end up with stuff that goes to a storage unit. That's a multi, multi-billion dollar business. And I happen to be guilty. I have a storage unit. But by the end of this year, I will no longer have a storage unit. It was just stuff I wasn't quite ready to part with. So, but by giving it to people that you know that would want it and giving them that choice. Um, and then, of course, the auction houses. And then... A lot of my clothing went to women's charities. Um, 
women who are in need and and didn't have clothing that was nice and they you know wanted it for their for their jobs and so forth and then also um to women vets that really goes to my heart so you pick your charities give it to your charities i had one yard sale (laughs) it was the worst experience of my life (laughs) and i Uh, gave 181 dollars and i remember you know, one of my, my shirts that I spent well over that for one shirt and somebody got it for like $5. And I'm thinking, you know, I, this is painful. That was painful Mm -hmm. for me. So I'd rather give it to people that wanted it or needed it rather than trying to sell it for $5. Yeah. So I know Mm -hmm. some people absolutely love Mm -hmm. yard sales and, you know, more power to them, but not me. That's not me either. I don't want, mm, no, (laughs) I get the heebie jeebies. If I go in somebody's house and they've got pathways and they got so much stuff, I yeah. just can't, I, you know, and like it's visual overload. And mm-hmm. in fact, so often I'll, I'll be in somebody's house and I'll be thinking they'll have like a really cool like display, like a China cabinet or whatever it may be. But there's so much stuff on it that it doesn't give value to right. any one thing. You know, right. if they just had a couple of items mm-hmm. then that are really special and beautiful, then I, I feel like you could appreciate them that much more. <clears throat> You brought up a really good point, Patty, and that is the less you have, the more you value what you have. And I mean, I'm in homes too, like you as, you know, in in your, in your business, you're in homes all the time. I have seen so many things over 35 years that, but, but what always, I, I think it concerns me actually when people have so much stuff, they, they, they don't have anything in there that, well, I shouldn't say that, but they they don't know what they have. And so therefore, how could you value that? So one of the services that we've provided over all these years is to just help them declutter. And, you know, you can still bring it out in the springtime and then put it away in the fall or, you know, so a seasonal (laughs) repurposing or um, whatever it is that makes them happy, but just to show them what would that cabinet look like with a third of the stuff or fourth of the stuff. And they can finally see it again. So I know for me, I had a beautiful library in my old house, and it was one of my favorite rooms. And it was um, <clears throat> bookcases, floor to ceiling, on all four walls. And when I started on that room in my downsizing journey, it was very difficult because almost everything in there had some meaning. So I decided to try this, and that was I would sit in a chair, I would look at that bookcase, and I said, Rita, <clears throat> on the top shelf, if you could pick one item on that top shelf, which one would it be? So mentally, I got rid of all the others. Then I went to the second shelf, the third shelf. And then I challenged myself, okay, in this entire bookcase, Mm -hmm. if you could pick (laughs) one or two things, what would they be? Guess what? It was more just developing a muscle around giving stuff, um, well, letting go. Basically, Mm -hmm. that's really what it was, is letting go of stuff that, and of course, it looked so beautiful when it was displayed and everything else. And and it looked much sparser as I took things away, but I started seeing them differently. You know, remembering, you know, that particular photograph or that seashell that, you know, we had collected when the boys were little. You know, those, those are the things that really matter. Yeah, I think, I think you've really given some great tips as far as how people can look at, um, mm-hmm. you know, look at the process start to look at a bookshelf or a room and say, okay, what are the things, if, if, I, if the house was on fire, what would I grab? Maybe yeah. that mentality, right? You know, we're like, yeah, very much I, so. yeah you're going to grab the dog. And, and, <laughs> yeah, that's maybe yeah, about the it. the dog and maybe the Shutterfly book. Right. You know, the <laughs> right. Shutterfly book that has all your memories in it right there. Yeah. Right. So, I yeah. mean, that's a, so, and, and then also, like you said, the wine parties, <laughs> where you invite some <laughs> friends. I like that idea a lot. Instead of painting parties, you can, you know, get rid of crap parties and have some mm-hmm. wine at the end of the day. That's, that sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You might as well make it fun. And, yeah. and truly, um, if, if your guests would like to go to that, it's, it's um, ABCs of Downsizing, Rita Wilkins. And I hope that it helps them because it certainly helped me and I might as well pass that on. Yeah. And how else <clears throat> can people find you to, to look you up, Rita? Okay. So my website is designservicesltd.com and my office number is 302-475-5663. And I'm known as the Downsizing Designer. Well, that is so terrific. You've been really wonderful, and I loved having you on. I, I hope that uh, you will inspire a lot of people to, to spend their weekends getting rid of crap.
crap. <laughs> go and and maybe just stuff. for four hours at a time, have them go have some fun too. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I like that. I'm going to try yeah. that as long as Good. I can get my husband to do it. <laughs> so check it out and check out uh, your, your TEDx talk too. And your TEDx talk, mm -hmm. if they look that up. Is Rita Wilkins and it's Downsize Your Life, Why Less is More. And Wilkins is W-I-L-K-I-N-S. INS, correct. Yes. Yeah, so you want to check out our TEDx talk because uh, that's terrific. And you've been a great guest. So I just want to thank you again. And uh, this wraps up this episode of the Pimple mm -hmm. Patty Show where we're keeping it real in real estate. So until thank next you. time. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye.